Mut. <laughs> okay, and we're back. Let's try this again. Very sorry, everybody. Um, good job me introducing myself as a stage manager and then completely failing to use any of the online technology properly. Hooray! Alex says we've got me back on both Facebook and Instagram. Okay, so yes, for anyone who's now joined late, welcome. Um, I am Ben. As I said, I'm a, I was a training director at the King's Head, now a junior associate. Um, recently directed Jerker at the King's Head, and now we're going to talk about today's play, finally, which is Lungs uh, by Duncan McMillan. Um, so previously, as I said, we had Hedda Gabler and we had Top Girls, um, and where I think I've got something, um, an interesting or different challenge is that um, whereas something like Hedda, which premiered in 1891, or, or Top Girls, uh, which is in 1982, this play um, first came out in 2011, I believe. So we're looking at a far more recent um, piece of work. And why, why that's different is that we can start to see, we can definitely see with Hedda, for example, that it has stood the test of time uh, because we're still talking about it over a hundred years after it premiered we're also seeing it with plays like top girls the, the change in direction and in conversation from um talking about it as a piece of new writing to talking about uh, its history and what it showed people were feeling and thinking at the, at the time and where it's it's where it's gone since then and now looking at kind of its impact on theatre more widely, which I think Liz did really, really well last week. Um, I don't have this benefit. Um, as I said, Lungs is nine years old now this year. Um, so I guess one of the, the sort of first questions for everyone is, um, is this going to be a play for, for the canon? Is it going to last as long? Um, as head, are we going to see it revived and revived and revived? Is it going to be talked about more academically in the future as a show, which was interesting in one moment, but maybe um, people in future generations will see as not as relevant? Um, so I think that's always worth sort of bearing in mind and thinking about um, with new writing. Certainly for this one, we can see um, in the sort of sheer volume of productions that we've had so far since its 2011 premiere, um, its international um, productions, the fact that it's toured the country continuously, been revived um, at the Fringe for numerous years, and recently, obviously, at the Old Vic um, with Matt Smith and Claire Foy in the in the two lead roles. So it certainly looks good in terms of its long term future as play and a part of the camp, but. Um, as always, it's a question, it's open-ended, and we shall see. Okay, so um, this was Duncan McMillan's second play. Um, he wrote it um, after Monster, which won the Brentwood Prize in 2005 and was staged in 2007. So two years after um, that one was written. Oh, hi, Adam. Good to see you as well. Um, which I think I kind of speaks about sort of production length of time. Sometimes people think that plays are written and they just go out there. Um, there's obviously this sort of a delay between them. and it was in a delay whilst he was working on a, another project, a much larger project, that he ended up, that Duncan McMillan wrote Lungs. Um, so this play debuted in 2011, but he, in an interview, said that he wrote it in 2008. So as you can see, again, a long period of time um, and a period for him sort of filled with sort of frustrations in the sense of trying to write a much larger show for the old Vic. Um, which he'd been working on for about three years um, that I believe just still hasn't um, sort of surfaced as a play. But um, what he then decided to do was take a break from this project and write a play that he says was direct, clear, fast, fun, and most importantly, stylistically more paired back. So he wanted to write something for two really good actors where they could tell a story and mediate it by props, scene changes, costume changes, mime, lighting, or sound cues, just two bodies in space, letting the audience fill in the gaps. So as uh, I guess sort of as readers, we're sort of looking and we should ask how successful has he been um, in that sort of objective. Okay, so I said 2011 was when the play came out. So let's um, try and sort of step back out of this sort of very long month that we've, we've all just had and think about what's um, sort of happening around 2010. So, um, 2010, 11, sorry. So 2010 um, obviously was marked by um, an election year in, in the UK. So um, the uh, Labour government were left and we ended up with a coalition government between the Tories and the Dems. Um, David Cameron famously also said at this point, um, vote blue, go green. There was a lot of kind of campaigning about how his Conservative Party would be the greenest party 
ever. Um, the Green Party in that election also won their first parliamentary seat in Brighton, which um, for those of you who read the play will obviously sort of ring a bell. You'll be like, aha, I remember Brighton. I saw that um, in the piece, so that's good. Um, Barack Obama was in his um, in his first term. The London Olympics was was coming up. Remember when we were so optimistic about the London Olympics? Um, the Arab Spring um, also happened um, in 2011. Occupy Wall Street were kicking off with all sort of their campaigning. Um, and um, Game of Thrones premiered. Um, so thinking as well, again, sort of looking at sort of the history of the play about what it the world looked like when it was first written and what it looks like now um, when it's revived and sort of what resonances may have changed or not changed um, within that time. And thank you for everyone still joining us on um, Instagram. I can see more of you coming on there. So that's excellent. Um, hopefully everybody on um, Facebook has managed to catch up with me again now as well. Uh, so welcome. Let's. Um, keep talking about this please do if you have any other thoughts questions do share them um ask them I, I will keep talking so don't worry about that but um anything that i say if it sort of sparks something do just sort of join in and throw something out there okay um so what happens in in lungs what are the sort of the facts of the play as it were um so we have two characters in the play and um, they're just called m and w um why why two people um I think it's just sort of as a fringe director was sort of pointing out um sort of all thematic explorations aside or kind of everything else um it's it's always cheaper to to write a two-person play um duncan mcmillan has sort of mentioned that he saw maybe that this play would would go on at the sort of in a pub theater maybe on top of another show um and sort of it was obviously something he really wants just to kind of put out there and, and see what happens so writing a two-hander with very minimal props, sound, lighting, etc., is a really good way of making sure that your work can just kind of find a home. And um, obviously, it's now gone on to be even more successful since. But it's worth um, thinking about how sort of constraints of theatre can sometimes drive innovation um, as much as you could sort of see how it might it might restrict it. Um, Cool. So, um, Duncan McMillan, um, actually, there's a really interesting thing if I'm uh, going to refer to the text, which obviously I am, um, in which he talks about, um, yeah, the, uh, the letters W and M are not character names. Any program material should simply list the actors and not who they are playing. Uh, so, I guess differently to say sort of header or top girls, there are no iconic roles or um, famous sort of historical figures um, like in those in those two plays. Um, they're not iconic characters that we're going to kind of see or like identify by a name. It's not going to be someone's header, for example. Um, but it's not. Nor is it a situation um, in sort of compared to playwrights like um, Nassim Sulamampur um, in White Rabbit, Red Rabbit or Blank, where the sort of actor or participant is playing themselves in this given situation. There's, there's no blurring in, in that sense. They are definitely characters on stage. So why would you ask for these characters not to be not to be named? Um, or why would you not give them names as a playwright? I think it's a really interesting question for us to ask. Um, I think probably I would offer that it's because Duncan McMillan wants us to see ourselves in these characters and to kind of, we, he wants to avoid us detaching ourselves from everything that's happening on stage and kind of putting that barrier in front of that work and then leaving the theatre going, well, that was fun, but it doesn't affect me. It's, this is a play which is meant to um, spark debate, meant to make us really think about um, ourselves as well. Um, so that's my solution, but if you have anything else, do please comment um, and let us know. Uh, what about the characters themselves? Um, so if I'm going to very quickly summarise them, um, M seems to be a character sailing closer towards some sort of kind of typical um, stereotype or maybe even male figure, a kind of, uh, it will all be fine because it's been fine for me so far, kind of detachment pervades through a lot of his lines, um, particularly early on in the play. Um, so I guess you've got the sort of question of how much of this is is genuine um, versus versus performed and where does he go through the piece itself? W um, is probably, again, more stereotypically um, 
femininely highly strung, more of a middle class warrior, um, by which I mean that it's a worry that comes from a privilege of not having to worry about the basic necessities. So these these worries aren't about her survival on a on a day to day basis. They are worries that come from her thinking about her situation and and her life, and come from a a level of of privilege. Um, and my question for that would be: to what extent are these worries genuine versus deflections from maybe the emotional issues of the play or the relationship? In the relationship I say between M and and W. Um, setting wise, um, Duncan McMillan again offers me some very handy things as a reader and as a director. Um, the play should be set in the city that it's being performed in. Any references in the text that suggest another place should be amended. Uh, so he's he's kind of given us a a large amount of leeway to make it very specific, um, make it about us in the moment in the place that we are which again i think is really important when we're thinking about the the themes of the play and what he's trying to get us to to think about and how we how i'm just trying to get us to not not avoid or deflect from from the issues as personal to us as well okay so how does the play work um what what form have we got here? It is structured as one long conversation. It changes place, it changes time, it drops in and out. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's serious, but overall we are following this singular kind of thread of a conversation throughout this whole, the whole piece. Um, it is in probably one of the most joyful things you can ever hear walking into a theatre when the usher says it to you, probably about 80 minutes straight through, no interval. Um, so once we're in, we're in, we're going to follow the entirety of the plot without taking a break or a moment to pause. And that's worth thinking about as well when we think about how plays are structured or laid out. We're following the sort of the life of this couple all the way through. There's no point for us to pause because there isn't a point for us to pause in our lives either. It kind of adds to the kind of urgency of the piece. It contains the debate and there gives no sort of escape or outlet to it, much like we would feel if we were in that situation ourselves, which hopefully Duncan McMillan is going to make us feel that we are. Um, there are about 60 scenes of in this unbroken conversation. But as I said, it, it carries on straight through. So you've got options, I think, to kind of blur this or not um, as, as a director or depending on how you on how you stage it. Um, there are obviously complete sentences, but mostly kind of the text itself is sort of shards of overrunning conversations and ideas with characters overlapping each other, cussing themselves off and sharing sort of thoughts and ideas all the way through. So initially what might look like a very sort of like confusing um, piece of writing actually, um, as we'll discuss when we sort of get more on, on the form itself, works brilliantly at kind of containing us into that sense of debate and continued thought between this couple as we kind of see the story unpacked um, across the full length of the play and of their lives. Okay, so a bit about the plot, and uh, yes, I am gonna ruin it for you if you haven't read it, very sorry. Um, but this is book club, so hopefully hopefully you have already, and uh, hopefully what everything I'm gonna say is completely what you thought and recognised from the piece as well. If it isn't, do please let me know, and if there's anything that I missed that you think is particularly important, do comment as well. So the play itself in, starts in, um, in an Ikea with M bringing up to W the idea of, of having a baby, obviously probably the worst place in the world uh, that you can start having this conversation, definitely as W says. Um, so there's an ensuing argument in which they head home, they keep talking about this idea and we get to a monologue from um, W where, um, she says, it's just the picture of my life I've always had since I was able to think, and I've never, ever questioned it. Never. She's talking about the idea of, of having a child, this image of kind of, that is what you do. So this is what we're, we're debating in this in this piece, the kind of, we're talking about where society expects us to go, and the questions that they ask each other within this play is going to get us to think about kind of the validity of that or not. Um, so then they start debating the idea of having a child. Um, as W says, I want to do everything for a right reason or at least a good reason. 
um, it's important, probably the most important thing you could do to bring a person into the world, um, we assume. Um, and if you thought about it, really properly thought about it for actually doing it, then you'd never actually do it because it's it's too too and she she fades off. Um, but we kind of understand the enormity of what she's thinking about when it comes to bringing a child into the world. Um, they discuss more sort of about this issue and what sort of comes up as a as a theme is the idea of being a good person. Um, we're good people, uh, says M, as a kind of a way for for justifying why they can have this child. Um, but within that, they sort of talk about um, the cost of a baby weighing up sort of um, uh, its carbon emissions and how to offset those possibly, how to compare themselves with others. They consider maybe adopting as a good idea. They worry if they'll be good parents and they think about how you actually go about raising a child, which kind of is like a nice sort of first, first section, I think, of the, of the piece. And then they decide um, to do it. They decide to to have the the child, although they do kind of immediately undermine this by arguing again. But I think we can kind of see them as kind of deciding, great, we're going to have this child. Um, so they start uh, then sort of exploring their connections in terms of um, their sexual relationship, in terms of how they have this child. Um, they then start, um, so M at one point actually, this says, I feel already that we're not equal somehow, that I never know, quite know what it feels like and you'll know that I can't, and, and then he fades off. Um, again, he can't quite phrase what he's thinking at this point. Um, so you can kind of see that rather than just um, a sort of external battle, there's an internal emotional battle as well. Um, M decides to get a real job, um, W quits smoking, they start making proactive choices to have this child and make sort of life changes. Um, they talk about the carbon footprint again. You get some amazing lines where M points out he could fly to New York and back every day for seven years and still not leave a carbon footprint as big as if he had a child. Um, w has um, a fantastic line, which I'm going to very quickly find for us. Um, 10,000 tonnes of CO2. That's the weight of the Eiffel Tower. I'd be giving birth to the Eiffel Tower. So we're talking about kind of this like huge sense of responsibility these two people feel about having a child. And again, the value of, of being good and what being good means. Um, then we're going to get to kind of almost like part three of it, almost the rising action, you could say, if you were sort of dramatically plotting it, um, where they start um, actually having the child, their pregnancy tests, they tell the parents when they realise that they're pregnant. Um, they start to panic about the the burdens of what they're sort of taking on. Now it becomes even more real. Um, then they're struck by a miscarriage and the fallout from this in which M cheats with W or someone in his office. W then has a, a revelation where they say, I needed you to be patient with me to wait as long as it took. I needed you to be braver than me and put your own feelings second and to understand even when you didn't understand, to use your initiative for once and not need instructions. And this is kind of like, it's a really sort of key point in the play, I think, where we really start moving towards the emotional discussion of the play and what they want from each other in a relationship rather than just this sort of external um, existential fear of sort of climate change and the environment. They break up, um, but very quickly now, as the play sort of picks up towards the end, fall back together, when W asks M to come to her mum's funeral, um, they have sex again after this, um, but then decide never to see each other again. Very quickly, though, in a sort of kind of almost Richard Curtis Love Actually type moment, um, W is back because she is pregnant. Um, and then sort of in our denouement, um, M leaves his fiance for W and we get this sort of epilogue that follows the life of their child uh, and the end of theirs sort of in a very sort of short number of pages relative to kind of the rest of the discussion that we've had. Um, and a resolution that brings back this sort of theme of, of climate change as W describes what's happened to the world and what their child thinks about them and what they've done to the world. Um, so that, very briefly, is the, is the entirety of, of Lungs and what's going on. And what I think I'd, I'd really like to talk about is, um, is to look at kind of actually how it is, how it is laid out, because I've, I've touched on it, but I think it is one of the most sort of like incredible things about about this this piece um we've got kind of and again another lovely set of instructions um, as i said there's a very clear instruction from the director to um sorry from the writer that there be no scenery furniture props or mime costume changes and light and sound should not be used to indicate a change of time or place um we also have um sort of those kind of i guess a lot of modern plays have them now the instructions for how to read the play 
Um, so the forward slash mark uh, marks a point of interruption in overlapping dialogue. And here's where I'm going to sort of connect it to kind of Carol Churchill as well, because I think, I believe, again, please someone correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, um, that Carol Churchill um, was the first person to kind of use this sort of forward slash and this instruction to show overlapping dialogue. So we can kind of definitely connect this play as to like a, into the post Carol Churchill um, theatre landscape and kind of see her impact looming large across kind of all sort of modern, modern plays. Um, but we also have um, commas on separate lines indicating a pause, rest or silence, the length of which would be determined by context and the absence of a full stop at the end of a line indicating a point of interruption, a trailing off or an interruption of thought. Um, so kind of in, in a lot of ways, then it's almost laid out like a poem on the page. Um, but the effect itself end up not being a sort of stylized verse type thing, but giving us a really naturalistic idea of how people talk and how people sort of um, draw their thoughts together, which I think is is incredibly exciting. Um, Duncan McMillan says, um, I think there's a perception that the playwright is someone who writes the spoken text and that everything else is the domain of the director. Um, he pointed out that for him, that is not the case, or at least it's not the case with with many of his projects. Um, Duncan Miller isn't just a writer. Um, he co-directed the production of 1984 with uh, Robert Icke, I believe. Um, he also works a lot with um, with Katie Mitchell and sort of collaborates very closely as a kind of writer and director, but more sort of theatre makers together to create their, their works. Um, and I think you can kind of see this in the in the way that he's laid out the text because he's he's not just offered as a piece for us to kind of um, do what we want with. He's very clear in his intentions as to kind of where these people are, how they're interacting with each other. Um, there's obviously a lot for a, an, an actor to do, but I think it's it, you can kind of see that instinct in him as not just someone giving us a text and then and then leaving it. And I think in the UK that's. Um, very interesting for us to think about where we do talk about, we talk about the primacy of the writer and honouring the writer's intentions, but we do also talk about the um, the sense that the director is in charge of the room entirely and um, puts their sort of stamp on on work in some ways. Um, so again, I think it's a nice sort of interesting modern tension, or tension of modern theatre that we can kind of look at and, and think about with this piece as well. Okay. Um, we also have, okay, so that's, um, that was sort of the layout of it. That's the, we've done the kind of the, the plot of it. And then we sort of, I guess it's sort of done move on to the, um, the themes of the, of the text, the, um, overarching sort of story of the piece, um, is the question whether or not to have a child. Um, it's a question which is explored through the piece, but is explored through kind of touching on these of the other themes of, of the play. So um, for a start, we have obviously the kind of the environmental issues, um, sort of the intellectual horror of the, of the piece, you could say, is um, us looking at the real cost of, of having a baby in terms of its environmental impact. Um, and sort of more widely, I guess, looking at the, the impact of humans in general on on the planet they talk a lot about um sort of the weather whether it's very cold whether it's incredibly hot and that sort of theme sort of progresses through and we can it's not just about observing the weather it's about getting us to really think about the the impact of of humanity on things like the weather and um so let's um let's just let's go to sort of what duncan mcmillan says as well um so he says although it's not a true story. I'm sure writing lungs was a way for me to articulate a number of anxieties I was subconsciously having about turning 30, considering parenthood and the state of the world. I wrote the very first draft. I wrote the first draft very quickly. I started first thing in the morning and by midnight I'd got to the end. And to start with, that's that's horrifying for me to read as someone who's always tried to tried to write or work. Um, and then to realise that this this piece as a first draft was written within a day. Um, but let's not let's not dwell too much on that. Um Let's look at kind of um, what he's what he's trying to do there is so he's trying to articulate kind of his anxieties as as a writer. Um, so again, this environmental question and um, the question is how successful is this as a play about about the environment? Um, 
as a lot of people talk about it as a, as a piece that um, is as an environmental play or a play about the environment and they analyze it as a play um, about protecting the planet or the discussion around that. Um, and that to me is, is, is really interesting because it actually as a, as a piece doesn't attempt to kind of, there's no, there's no one trying to be persuaded about the, um, about the impacts of climate in it. Like there's no, the dramatic tension doesn't necessarily come from the, um, from the sort of the, what is happening to the planet. Um, the, the debate goes slightly beyond that and, um, looks towards sort of the people within it, which I think is why it's a really successful and really incredible play. Um, so yeah, he, um, John Goodman says, I found myself worrying about these things and I didn't know the solution. He discusses the anxiety debt um, that his generation has inherited. I think that's that's the real kind of um, thrust of the piece is um, what do we do? Um, we have we can see this kind of looming threat of climate change. How do we carry on? How do we be good? How do we make good choices? Um, and as he said as well, putting characters on stage to talk about these anxieties makes them quite absurd. And they are. It is absurd. You can have a conversation now about whether or not you want to start family. And at the same time, you can be talking about the industrial revolution. So he talks about how difficult this, what they kind of try and do and what they try and unpack, how difficult that can be for them. Um, so yeah, what he and then ends up, ends up kind of concluding is the thing to try and find is the best form to articulate how it's like to be alive from your perspective right now. The idea is to reach out to one person in the audience every night and just say, you're not alone, you're not crazy, and here is how I've been feeling. That for me is theatre its best. Um, so that's Duncan McMillan still talking there. Um, but I, I'd agree with him. I think that what he's trying to do there is sort of, he's not trying to give us an answer to climate change. He's trying to say, um, look, we know this is happening, but what can we do on an individual level when faced with kind of global, global catastrophe? How do we keep moving on? Um, so it's a climate change play, but it, it kind of isn't um, in, in a lot of ways, like putting it on again now, what may have been really provocative about its discussion of environmental impact uh, previously is now very, very mainstream. Like we increasingly people aren't talking about like if climate change is happening, it's it is. And what do we what do we do about it? So then we're looking at this kind of other theme of the piece, which is the relationship between M and W under these middle class millennial pressures, moving from their 20s to their 30s, asking if they can have a, a child or not. And ultimately, if they are good people. Um, so he wants Duncan wants to write a play about um, a private conversation between two thoughtful, educated middle class people struggling to do the right thing. Um, it's dramatically active, but the narrative sort of isn't compelled by unraveling a lie or a secret. Um, so for him, the drama is in this decision making. Um, everything sort of pours out of these two people. It's uncensored. It's impulsive. It's it's raw. Um, what we can then see is kind of this sort of personal, political, or private and public conflict um, stretched out in front of us. Um, and what what I ended up sort of looking at and really taking from the from the piece is um, sort of a moral about being good and how at the start of the play when they talk about being good they talk about kind of the environmental impacts and they talk about what they can do and they're talking about actually i think perfect they're talking about how to kind of um be perfect people in a world which is impossible to navigate and i think what the play does really beautifully actually is in this sort of play about having a baby where um a man makes supportive choices when he talks to the woman it's only when he realizes she needs him to know without being asked and to know sort of how he's feeling and how how they can interact that the relationship works and that's after it's fallen apart um so we're kind of seeing this idea that a man a man realizes right at the end that um it's the emotional labor he needs to do um, so I'm going to pull out the quote. You needed me to know what you need without having to ask. You needed me to be aware of how I'm feeling and to let you into my head. Right now, I know exactly what you need to hear, and it's absolutely what I'm feeling. And that's when they decide to commit. He decides to commit to have um, have this child and support um, W and marry her and kind of go on to kind of this denouement at the end. And it's about him learning about the emotional labour. It's about him becoming 
actually actually good stopping to try and being perfect and putting all these exterior sort of pressures on himself and thinking about himself as an individual and what he can do within that world and he realizes that what he can do is really truly support w in every way that he can um so yeah that kind of for me was really kind of that that hugely kind of important theme of the piece um very quickly let's talk um as we sort of finish off now then about um about staging it and about what staging it means now um so there's an interesting sort of quote from the Time Out review of um the revival at the old vic which says um our national vibes have gone a bit downhill since the year of the olympics in particular fear of climate change has gone seriously mainstream so again we're, we're seeing this kind of idea that we all understand the pressures of climate change now what we're looking at um is that relationship about what we can do as a couple and the small scale when surrounded by that um, and I think staging is really interesting to think about that when you think about how it's been put on by Plains Plow in their roundabout theatre, or the old Vic used on stage seating, meaning that the actors were surrounded. Um, so it wasn't just about these two people. It was about us looking at them and in the way that it's staged, being able to see each other as well and thinking about ourselves, thinking about our impact and thinking about what we do. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's really important to think about this piece is that it's a discussion starter and the way that it's often staged gets to really think about that by making us see and connect with each other as well as the issue on stage. Um, if we do stage it now as well, and there's a there's another a further challenge which is um, looking at kind of obviously this is a play about the environment, so are you duty bound as a director, as a, as a company, as a producer to think about the show's impact to which I'd offer yes. So I'd always sort of say, always when you're kind of looking at this, think about um, companies like um, Staging Change or Julie's Bicycle that do amazing work kind of making theatre more sustainable and thinking about the environmental impact of theatre. Um, things like um, Set Exchange or Free Cycle in terms of like not just creating waste and um, not thinking about the impact of everything within kind of the wider creation of a piece of work. Um, so I'm going to leave that as a challenge for you all at the end as well. Um, Katie Mitchell, in fact, even went further when, when she did her production um, in Germany, she had the two actors on static bikes powering the stage um, as they sort of, as they pedal, so keeping the lights on as they did the piece, um, which I think is really interesting, kind of a nice way to kind of hammer home that point that it is all of us. We are all involved in this. We are all involved in in our impact, um, even actors pretending on stage have an impact. Um, so thinking about that too. Um, I'd like to leave you all kind of with a question, which is um, what happens to this play in the future? As I said, like it's a very new play. Um, do we think that it's going to keep being so resonant, so so relevant? Do we think that it's going to um, fall out of sort of just maybe um, as we decide to um, Maybe once we once once we move to like a full green economy, for example. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, will this play still be be resonant? Will it still be something we look back on and kind of see a relationship as a main story and kind of look at that history of where they were in terms of kind of the environment, or is it something that we're going to look back on and regret and see that we had this huge chance to help people out and to change the world and we we missed it, we lost out. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's kind of what I'd what I'd leave with you. Um, there as well um always nice to think about maybe maybe further reading um obviously duncan mcmillan um did a uh, wrote another play after this one with katie mitchell called 2071 which definitely and directly addressed um the impact of climate change in the environment um um also yeah alistair mcdowell's obviously um wrote all of it recently which is a sort of another sort of similar um, play in its sense of um, stream of consciousness um, that was the Royal Court recently, but it's well worth reading for kind of also looking and thinking about form. Um, and then Sam Steiner, I'd sort of drop as well for lemons, 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 where kind of it's a relationship, but it's examined amongst kind of a larger sort of outward pressure as well. So um, again, you can see there's, there's lots of other plays that kind of play around with this sort of form um, or could be connected to it in some way. Um, but I think that's going to be all that we've got time for in terms of looking at talking about the play. Is there anything from anybody? I can't see any questions from people. Um, so I'm going to assume that what I've done is perfectly talk about and answer 
everything. Uh, so thank you all very much for joining and for watching. It's been lovely to be able to talk and um, I hope you've all sort of enjoyed it, taken something from it. If you haven't read